From the Marquee Media Studio inside Mark Tank, it's the Mark Haney Show. Yes, this is the Mark Haney Show. Super excited about today's show. I'll introduce it in a sec. We interrupt this podcast with a special message about GFX. It is the premier venture conference in the Sacramento region, and it's October 10th at the grounds. It's our third one, and this event is like no other. It's venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, small business people, VIP leaders of Sacramento coming together all around building businesses and building the backyard advantage. This year, we have great content. There's going to be world-class speakers on artificial intelligence, fintech, govtech, medtech, and so many other things in helping you to build your business, you to uh, grow your investment portfolio if you're an investor. It's going to be great. We are going to be recognizing people who have done great things here in the region. It's called the Backyard Awards as part of this event. And really, it is the place to be, again, October 10th, at the grounds in Roseville, be there. It is the place to be. But we are uh, brought to you by the Growth Factory, building the backyard advantage, the most connected community in the world for local entrepreneurs. And it's based around a culture of love. We like to help entrepreneurs. And so today on the show, we've got a couple of men that uh, are known Uh, around the region and beyond for their work in helping entrepreneurs. We have John Gregory of Five Star Bank and, of course, James Beckwith. He's the CEO of Five Star Bank. So we have uh, the leadership powerhouse uh, duo from Five Star. We're going to talk a little bit about banking, uh, their expansion. They they went public uh, a couple years back and they've uh, figured out a way to uh, do something important with uh, these new resources. Um, We're going to talk about winning uh, but I wanted to do an icebreaker question, though. So as you guys came into the lobby here at the Growth Factory, you might have saw all the football stuff around. We had fantasy football draft last night. We had about 50 people playing. We broke it up into like five leagues. And so my question of you guys is, who's going to win the Super Bowl? And I want to make sure we date this. The season has not started yet. Uh, and so we're uh, like a week before the regular season starts. And so by the time this airs, it might be a little bit dated, but uh, I think this is airing in a couple of weeks. But let's start with you, James. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? But I need a prediction. Well, this is going to be the year that the Niners are going to get over the hump. They've been knocking at the door for three years now, and uh, it's going to happen this year. Okay, so as we were talking a little bit earlier, Brandon Ayuk still hasn't signed. Uh, Trent Williams, their their big left tackle, hasn't signed. But they've got some great rookies. What is the reason? You know, what's their advantage? Right, it takes, it takes an advantage like the backyard advantage to uh, to accomplish great things. What do you see as the Niners' uh, advantage? Well, there's two things. It, the defense is still very stout, um, and their quarterback is a great quarterback not a good quarterback a great quarterback and they got this kid from florida who can flat out run uh, who's that who's the white out Cowie? oh no. uh, uh pearsall oh. or pearsall 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 yeah, yeah. To go with debo yeah i think debo that's a, a powerhouse he's like a running back as a receiver so yeah they have uh, i think they got they have some talent and you know of course their tight ends all world uh yes and, george uh, kittle and so i think that they're they're gonna be great they've got great running backs you know, I, I, it's, I, it's hard to say what their weakness is, right? Yeah. Now, maybe the Chiefs don't make it to the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> that would be helpful, <laughs> yes. Now, John, you also like the NFC West. Um, do you have a Super Bowl prediction? I know you're a Rams fan. Somehow up here in Northern California, you're a Rams fan. Well, I was, I was born in Southern California. Ah, that's so true. I, that's my excuse. And it's no fun if everybody roots for the same team, right? True. You've got to have some competition there. That said, I'm, I'm a respectful fan, and, and I – also think it's the 49ers year oh, you do. given uh the the team that they built the coaching from shanahan is blocking schemes running game the way he misdirects plays always has defenses on their heels um uh, my sleeper uh is that I, th- I think the joe burrow led Bengals will be tough again this Ooh, year and yes. i think he's got it he's got what it takes to maybe knock off Mahomes and Kansas City on the AFC side. So I'm super excited about the NFL upcoming season. I, I wish it were the Rams because I, you got to love that wide receiver duo of Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua 
And look out in fantasy football, the new rookie, Jordan Whittingham from University of Texas. So I've never heard of that's him. A what, sleeper. Is, uh, what is he, uh, what position is he's he He's wide receiver. He'll wide be receiver. wide receiver number three. Oh, okay. Plays same style as, as Puka okay. and Cooper, very physical. Was a running back in college. Kind first. of like a possession receiver type exactly, guy. Exactly, but okay. great with uh, great with the yak yards after the catch too. Ah, love it. Okay, so I'm going to predict the Niners as well. This is pretty sad. We're all going Niners, and my rationale for that because right now we still have the couple of holdouts that I mentioned. So I would say even if they don't sign these guys, because you know these guys are not they're playing under a, a contract and they're they're basically telling their employer, look, we're uh, we need more money, which is you know I have a. Uh, philosophical uh, problem with that personally but uh, you know everybody looks out for themselves so I get that but I think that their advantage is their and you guys have mentioned this their ability to sort of figure it out the play calling and the team chemistry a lot like five star bank you figure it out you might uh you know, it's not you're not super reliant on one high priced uh, player. You've got a lot of great players on the team, and figuring out a way to work together is really the key to making any team work. So, uh, so thanks for joining me on the show, guys. We we never break the show with uh, Super Bowl predictions. This is a first out of <laughs> like since 2015 when you first started supporting the show, James. We've never broken the sh- Broken the show that I'll open this way, but uh, thanks for doing it today. Let's talk about how you guys are breaking it open. You guys went public a couple of years ago, and maybe just describe the bank as an overview, but then talk to us about the growth and what's led to the growth and you know what we can expect to see in the, in the coming you know months and years. Well, sure, Mark. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me and John. We really uh, always look forward to coming in and having a conversation with you, so thank you. So, uh, as you mentioned, we did go public in 2021. We also had a follow-on offering, a follow-on offering uh, that we closed in um, in April. Similar size, around 80 million dollars. Um, so we're using that capital to really to fuel growth. It's offensive capital, not defensive. It's offensive capital. So uh, uh, we've had a tremendous growth rate over the last five years, 20 percent per year compounded annual growth rate. Wow. And we expect to continue to push it. Uh, so we're awfully excited about that. You know, we're a commercial bank. Uh, and there's been a lot of turmoil in banking, as you know. Um, and it's really helped us kind of focus our efforts, uh, not only here locally, here in the capital region, but also what we're doing down in the Bay Area. Can you elaborate on that? So you see opportunity within this uh, turmoil. What what did you see and what... Um how, do you, how are you capitalizing on it? Sure. Um, and let's talk about the, the Bay Area. So two years ago, there were fundamentally two banks that dominated the Bay Area. That was Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank. And they had a tremendous market share. Well, they don't exist today. Mm-hmm. And then when you consider those two banks, along with Signature Bank, that doesn't exist... And the mergers that have occurred with Union Bank being bought by U.S. Bank and uh, Bank of Montreal uh, buying Bank of the West, you have a tremendous amount of turmoil that's happening. Customers don't know where their banker is. They can't. They don't want to call a one eight hundred one eight hundred number. They feel disenfranchised, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know. And um, our business model is one is is one of high service and high technology. And so we think that that really bodes well for us as we as we extend our reach. And you know, we're we're a capital region bank, and I don't want anybody to forget that. This is where our roots are. I was born in Sacramento, and we're never going to forget that. So we come from a position of strength um in in terms of what we're trying to uh what we're doing and executing on down in the Bay Area. Uh and we're excited about it. To date, we've hired 21 people down there. Uh, and we're going to be opening our office in downtown financial district um, in September, end of September. So we're excited. We're excited about it. Now we do a little. We do a little advertising on you know as good Giants fans are on KMBR. You know we do the pregame, <laughs> and we end with the statement. This I came up with this one, Mark. Uh, uh, we believe in San Francisco. Now. Not a lot of people are saying that in the United right States. Right now, the trend is uh, what's going on with San Francisco. Right. You know, things are sh- shuttering, uh, you know, like North, you know, certain retailers are shuttering the doors. Sure. sure. And uh, uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that. 
Uh, but if you've been down there recently, I'm going to say in the last, the last six months, it's not what people say it is. It's actually a beautiful city. And uh, so we're excited about that. We see it as being a natural extension uh, of what we're all about here. Uh, we think it's a super region, Mark, mm-hmm. that uh, that includes the capital region and the Bay Area. Yeah. So let's do, do the little bit of geography here. So we have San Francisco, mm-hmm. we get the Silicon Valley and, you know, Santa Clara where the Niners play. And then it kind of forms, would you say uh, Sacramento is like at one corner of that? Or how does that uh, sure. geography and, break Sure, and I, I, I pick up Reno also okay. in that whole equation. Um, you've got the East Bay, you've got the North Bay, you've got the Capital Region, you know, of course, San Francisco proper, San Mateo County. Uh, and then what happens? And then down everything in, in between, you've got all uh, up and down I eighty. Yep. Yeah. It's one uh, economic region, yeah. and there's so much connectivity. And John will speak about this a little bit later on. So much connectivity to the capital region uh, down in the Bay Area, and vice versa. Uh, and we want to really bring um, what we've done here, especially in the venture banking space down there, but also let it be known to the venture community in the Bay Area that, hey, you should be looking at companies up in Sacramento because there's a lot of entrepreneurs up here, thanks to yourself and what you've been able to do here at the Growth Factory. But it's a very vibrant community, and not everybody knows about it that's from down there. Okay, so you're bringing the Bay Area to Sacramento and vice versa. John? I I would say that, that... That's a great analogy. I would go back and use both sports as well as the backyard advantage, which has been uh, great to see you and your team, along with other partners, build here in the Sacramento region. Uh, I would say we are going from a backyard advantage to a neighborhood advantage via this expansion. So think (laughs) about when you're you're growing up, right, and you love to play baseball, and on a weekday, you want to go outside and find some friends that maybe were across the street or up and down the street, but you could only get enough guys or gals together to play wiffle ball in the street. You know, maybe maybe four people, right? But if you wanted to have an all-out baseball game, you needed to expand beyond your street or your backyard mm-hmm. to the full neighborhood, and you I needed a that. little more planning. So you could do that on a Saturday or Sunday down at the schoolyard and in, in, engage a larger number of people. So I think with this expansion into the Bay Area from a venture perspective, it allows us to round out you know, the, the whole squad of players, whether it's investors, co-founders, service providers, and customers, and universities that are all critical to a singular kind of broader region perspective on the venture banking side. Yeah, and from a philosophical perspective, I think the three of us share this idea that if your neighbor succeeds, it's good for the neighborhood, right? So if Vallejo succeeds or Vacaville or San Francisco, it's not that our competitor succeeded. It tends to raise the other ships in the neighborhood, right? Everybody gets a little bit of benefit when the neighborhood is thriving or one of the members of the neighborhood is winning. It's good for the neighborhood. And uh, under James' leadership, I think it's really unique that we are the only bank that's attempting to create that back and forth bridge and establish that that regional approach. Oh, right? uh, okay. At least so, from a venture perspective. Right. Okay. So I want to. I want to. I'm going to put uh, like a, a put the venture in a parking lot for a second because I, I want our audience to understand venture banking and what it is and what it means. But in terms of uh, being the only one. I'm all about creating an advantage, right? So me, it's like as the small guy on uh, basically every sports team I ever played on, you got to figure out your little niche. And I've always felt even in small business, you're always the David versus the Goliath. So you guys are really a smaller bank comparatively to some of the, you know, the mega banks. is that the re, is that an advantage? Is that why you are the ones doing it? Obviously, leadership is at the heart of uh, any successful endeavor, but it, is being small helpful? Absolutely. And in, into the context of uh, being able to fulfill relationships that you have with folks, but being incredibly nimble. Mm-hmm. You know, from top to bottom, there's not a lot of layers of organization at Five Star Bank, and we make decisions quickly. 
and um, I'm available, John's available immediately. And so we move on a dime and turn on a dime. So uh, that's a big advantage when you're competing against, uh, let's say, a, a, you know, a, a worldwide bank. And, you know, there's all types of approval levels and, and, you know, people that are stuck in that system maybe don't have the authority to be able to pull the trigger on something. Well, we already did. We already got the deal in front of somebody and we're closing it yeah. before they even get to it. So, so from a customer perspective, it, things happen faster. And yeah. What about it from a uh, organizational being able to make a decision to go expand into, you know, create your... Uh, your advantage, your you know sure. the, your mega region. That's a, a massive decision for any organization just to try to tackle that. Well, sure, and it starts at the top. Obviously, um, you know, management has deep roots. You know, I went to school down there, um, and and uh, Mike Rizzo, our chief banking officer, was born there in San Francisco. But it really starts at the top, at the board level. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs that have deep connectivity. To the Bay Area, and their businesses are entwined with what goes on in the Bay Area, and so we're we think that uh, it's not a foreign place to us. Rather, it's our neighborhood, and you know we understand it. We understand there's various different parts. I mean, downtown San Jose is a lot different than downtown San Francisco, and downtown Walnut Creek is a lot different than downtown San Francisco. And you have to you have to have some knowledge. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So let me just dive into the, you mentioned the board and I know a few of the board members and they come from construction and building backgrounds and they're very innovative in their, in their field. But a lot of what's happening in Sacramento uh, at some level, but for sure in the Bay area is the tech business. And so taking a business that like, like five star that has, I guess, started somewhat as, you know, helping contractors and s traditional small business. And now this venture banking, it's more about tech. Am I right, John? Yes, absolutely. I think it's one sliver, one piece of our overall banking business. Mm. An important one, particularly as we move into the Bay Area, you got to be at the table from the from the technology sector perspective if you're going to have a presence and expand in the Bay. And while, while I said that I was born in in Southern California, I actually grew up in San Jose, so I I know a bit about the neighborhood as well. And there's a lot of ways that we could try to penetrate venture banking into the Bay Area. But given the scale and the magnitude of it, we have to be strategic about that approach. Hence, working and finding talent from some of the, the prior incumbent banks that are no longer there, leveraging relate pre-existing relationships that we all have in the Bay Area. So it doesn't take us two years or four years to establish a presence, but literally be in market in less than a year. I'm going to make an assumption that startups and tech companies, they, they're they lending, their borrowing appetite is not as strong as somebody maybe who's in real estate, um, but they might have good deposits, right? They get an influx of venture capital or their sales are running through the roof. They, they might have a, a nice bank account. What's the... Uh, balance right now of uh, power in terms of like are, are banks looking for a little bit more deposits or are they looking more to lend how does that balance work within the banking industry well i think everything really starts uh, with the relationship and the relationship is driven by deposits mm. and, you know we're we've always been very good asset generators we can make loans uh and we do a great job of making loans in all markets we serve so we look towards that business that really needs help on that treasury cash management side to really optimize what they're doing. So they got money in the bank and like how to get it uh, working for them at some yeah, level. You know, uh, you know, simple things like, okay, how are you settling with your vendors? I mean, are you taking advantage of terms? Uh, are you maintaining the appropriate cash balances for a rainy day? You know, mm -hmm. how are you thinking about your liquidity of your company? Um, and how can you? How can we help you facilitate transactions that you need to have happen? How do we help your employees be more 
productive and effective. Those are the types of things that we like to bring to the table for these small business enterprises. Yeah. Okay. So what's venture banking? You know, you and I have talked about this a lot, John, over, you know, you working with our startups and within the growth factory and knowing the expansion into the Bay Area, I have to imagine that the venture banking, uh, it's it's a newer concept. Uh, You know, it's not brand new, but it's it's a little bit newer. It's foreign to, to some of us. Right. And, and to be successful and, and compete against the other players, we have to do all of the vital things that, that James mentioned that are critical for working with small businesses, contractors, other service providers in any business. But within the venture banking world, we have to do those things and be the best that we can at that. But we actually have to be active members of that venture ecosystem as okay. well. When so, you're working with these young, young companies, they need to build investor syndicates. They need their first customers. They need the right service providers. All of those things are critical. And, and we need to be part of that ecosystem to be able to make introductions on behalf of our customers and create an environment where they can meet like-minded folks. Is it harder work than traditional banking? Because it sounds like, you know, all these connections and those are relationship builders for sure. Uh, you're helping your customers succeed. Is that, is that take a little bit more elbow grease in the, in the, in the venture world than it does, let's say with uh, manufacturing? Well, I would <laughs> just say that early on the financial statements definitely look a lot different. <laughs> Yeah, but it's exactly. our job to right the, to, the profitability know. of a startup doesn't look like the profitability yeah. of uh, you know established company that's been around thirty years. But you have to be able to share that vision with them, right, and then help them get over that valley of death onto the point where they can scale that company and become you know a market leader or a major player and, and create lots of jobs and lots of wealth in their communities. So it's it's a has some of the same common things that you need to do for any business from a banking perspective. And then we also have to be able to add that extra piece of value add connectivity in there as well. Well, yeah. and it's 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 really about creating those connections that John's excellent with in terms of bringing new investors to the table, which is pretty significant for a startup company, yeah. uh, or bringing new executive talent to the table, um, and just creating that nexus in terms of uh, what these customers or our customers need to do, uh, whether it's if somebody's got a great fintech, excuse me, you know, application that they want to try out, we've always been game to say, hey, well, we'll look at it as a bank, and so uh, you know, it's creating that network and creating um, you know an ability to really accelerate these companies' growth just because we're there and we're thinking about them. And we're thinking, trying to think about what goes on in their minds and step into their shoes. How can I grow my business? Mm -hmm. Fundamental questions. How can I grow my business? And if you turn that around, how can we at Five Star Bank help you grow your business? And it's it's a different level of care that you give, um, you know, entities that are in a startup mode um, that have high growth potential. That could be unicorns. Because that guy or gal is going to remember that, hey, you really did me a solid, you know, Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And because you really steered me in the right direction and you really believed in me. And those, you know, you can't, that's invaluable to a, to a, to a a growth business and, and to a, a, an entrepreneur. Well, as a, as a bank that uh, is diving into this world uh, in a big, big way, and it's a guy that is, you know, helping startups and doing some venture capital as well. Um, it's more risky than other stuff, even if it's your time that we're talking about, right? Some of these startups, they don't make it. And so we're investing our time, we're investing, sometimes it's capital, or maybe we're lending money to earlier stage companies that traditionally are kind of viewed as more high risk. How do you guys balance that sort of thinking from a strategy standpoint? Sure. You know, let's talk about it as an investor from an investor perspective. So, um, you know, we're in your fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're in, uh, you know, four other funds up here. But we're also, we've just committed to making our first investment in a fund down there. Nice. And, you know, and so, you know, the fund, the venture fund model, you know, you make 20 investments, you know, 
five or six of them aren't going to go anywhere. Six of them, five or six are just going to limp along. And and then two or three are going to do better than average, but there's one or two that you could really hit. And so we understand that as LPs. Right. Okay. Now you put a, a bank veil over that. Um, you know, we're going to try and help these startup companies really help them manage their treasury, you know, and, and try to make sure they're optimizing from that perspective. You almost de-risk it a little bit for yourselves by being hands-on. Yes. And so we know what's going on with the company, right? And, uh, you know, I can, there's a half a dozen companies that, uh, you know, that we do that routinely. I mean, it, there's more than that, but I'm just saying in the last two weeks in terms of our efforts to help these companies have come up, you know, kind of bubbled up to me. And I said, yeah, let's do this, this, and this for them. Uh, and I think that we're, you know, it's, it's built on consistency, doing it week in and week out, trying to help these emerging businesses grow that I think builds reputation. And I think that, you know, it's a life's, it's a career's worth of work. And John does an excellent job of this. And it's really, it's really pushing us. Uh, he's got great connections down there. He's got great connections up here. So we're, we're awfully excited about where this business is going for us. I know you do the banking for a number of my startup friends and my other friends around Sacramento. And maybe we can dive deeper. You don't need to mention any names, but I know some startups, when they become uh, strong enough, they're able to go get venture debt and they're able to borrow money. When is that, uh, when is sort of like that turning point where they become viable for maybe taking on some debt from a, from a bank like Five Star? Well, they've, they've demonstrated um, that they've got a strong enough value proposition that customers are starting to buy the okay. product. Ideally, several customers and ideally those that are multiple and recurring in their revenue stream. Uh, who else is around the table from an investor perspective? Um, I think those are key for us is making sure that we feel that there's other financial partners that are willing to stick by the company as well as they grow so that we're not the only game in town when we're providing sure. a venture debt loan. Sure. And it's, it's a function of uh, them achieving, you know, uh, a decent level of revenue where you can actually give them some type, type of an asset baseline, a credit that revolves. Okay. Um, you know, so they're into, they're making product, it's been accepted, um, and we help them finance their inventory, and but principally receivables. Okay. Uh, and so it's that type of business. You know, profitability, you know, is visible. Whether it's present, it's certainly okay. visible. Well, a lot of these startups, they're spending so much money in growth that if you take that money that they're investing in growth, and you apply that toward the bottom line, right? They're taking their profits in, in many mm -hmm. cases and they're investing it in growth. So their profits don't look that strong because they're not, they're not in harvest mode. They're trying to grow the top line. Exactly. And you have to understand that. Yeah. You have to understand it. And in terms of uh, when I hear the word venture debt, maybe just an education for us in the, in the startup world, does that come with special strings attached? Do they call it venture debt? Is that... Uh, you know, is it higher interest rate? Is there, you know, are there other terms? Yeah, there, I mean, there's generally going to be a, a higher interest rate than a conventional loan. In many cases, there's going to be a, a warrant component. Mm. So they the, have an option to, to buy, do you guys have an option to maybe buy part of the company or something like exactly. that, a small it's fraction. A small yeah. amount, sometime downstream. Uh, we want to see that there's a runway of liquidity and have the ability to see their uh, financial statements on a on a monthly basis. So it's a, a tighter, I mean, obviously we're going to monitor all loans that we do closely, but within the venture debt space, it's really important that we have a very tight ongoing relationship with not just the founder, but the CFO and with the investors. So we are aware of maybe any hiccups or opportunities that are occurring on a month by month basis with those companies. And it's really, a you know, the relationship with the lead investors that you really want to maintain and to understand what's going on. And, uh, and it's, it requires a much higher degree of communication and monitoring than a typical, you know, banking relationship, banking, uh, lending relationship. So uh, it's labor intensive, sure. Bears a much higher interest rate. And as John mentioned, 
I think more most of the time it comes with warrants. So there's you know there's going to be some if they're successful, we could be wildly successful. And we've had some success you know doing this type of lending over the years. Is that part of what uh, like Silicon Valley Bank? They they grew in size they, and they were very successful until they until they weren't obviously. Right. Uh, was that a big component of their business? Absolutely. Yeah. It was. They they were a universe unto themselves. Incredibly successful, um, and really helped get that business, the whole tech business, you know, Silicon Valley, everything that it's known for, to really get it going. I mean, you could just name so many companies that they work with at an yeah. early stage. And walk me back through this. So my memory, so I, I, one of my questions for you guys is where do you get your financial information from? I watch a lot of CNBC, so I get a lot of it just the mainstream media, uh, CNBC. Um, but as I remember watching these shows, the morning shows and stuff, it was like, there was a there was a run on the bank. So you got a mm-hmm. successful company and then all of a sudden they had, uh, I guess all these, uh, early stage companies decided to pull their money out uh, at roughly the same time and it just, you know, it just crippled them. Well, it was... Um, is, that a fair, is that a fair way to describe I think, it? I, I think so, but I think the, the real driver was uh, was really some of the venture fund managers oh. that said, hey, get you, call up the CEO, get your money out of here. Oh, and once, it can, it's like a and, domino effect. And then once that happens and then, you know, it's still, it's a tight community. You know what it's like up here? Yeah. And we're everybody you know we all know what we're all doing and we're all pulling on the same oar and so i'm going to suggest that it's the, it's very similar down there it's just more yeah right interesting um okay so from an economy so let's talk about the economy a little bit i want to talk local economies and then maybe broader perspective on the on the national economy um and whatever else you guys want to cover as well so bay area economy Sacramento economy. Maybe we'll start with Sacramento. What's uh, what's the economy of Sacramento look like from your guys' perspective right now? We think it's uh, it's good. Okay. We think it's good. Uh, um, unemployment is certainly manageable, and there is job growth. Um, you know, housing cost is given where interest rates are, or uh, it's difficult. But there's still a lot of homes being built, so there's a lot of activity on that new construction uh, front. And uh, so that's great to see because that drives a pretty big piece of our uh, of our economy, economy out here. Um, the entrepreneurial community is thriving; it's vibrant. Um, you know, there's it is so different than what it was 15 years ago, Mark. And you're you know you uh, should take some credit for that, if not a lot of credit, well, to you. really kind of driving that. It's a different mindset now. Um, investors here that are local are making investments in venture funds and and startup companies and doing sidecar deals, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so that's awfully exciting to see uh, that there's this asset class that the folks that have made a lot of money, let's say in real estate, uh, are actually saying, yeah, I need, I, I should have an allocation into this, into this, uh, uh, you know, into these, uh, you know, venture funds, if you will. Um, so, I think the economy here is very strong. So we're moving in the right direction. Some of that may have been from, you know, the mig- during COVID, we had a little bit of migration yep. here from the Bay Area and other places. So Sacramento is not losing population. Now let's, I know you guys are optim- optim- uh, opportunistic. So the Bay Area, we hear the stories about San Francisco. We hear some around Silicon Valley and some of these large tech companies are thinking about moving to Let's say Austin, or you know, you know, some other out of state. Um, are we at a? Uh, we've declined, I think, at some level. At least the sentiment has declined. Are we bottoming, and now we're ba- we're getting ready to bounce? Uh, that's my sense of it. Now, um, and you should check this statistic because the population pre-COVID versus what it is right now in the county of San Francisco, there's not that big of a difference. Okay. In fact, there might be a slight gain. Some Somebody, an investor told me that this morning and I go, I oh, I probably want to, you know, prove that, so to speak. Now, if you look to about what's happening, let's say in downtown financial district, San Francisco, you know, a lot of those suites, those office suites, nobody's in them, right? right? Well, people are doing work differently now. They're working out of their house right apartments are hard to get in san francisco why 
Well, a lot of people, that's not just where they live. It's also where they work. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that's true in all major metropolitan areas now. Um, so I think the economy down there is fine. Things have turned, I think, in a very positive way. Um, they're probably going to get some new leadership, uh, political leadership, um, you know, this fall. And uh, I think that people are still bullish. Tech people are still bullish on San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, would you agree? How do you, how would you, uh, you know, elaborate on that? Well, I, I play in a very you know, specific world at the, at the early stages. So a couple observations I would have is that uh, James made reference that we've made a conditional commitment to one fund in the Bay Area. Uh, to invest in and we're talking to a number of others over the past several months just to get a sense of the feel for activity and the five or six that I most closely talk with indicate that their deal flow their level of entrepreneurial activity is is rapid is huge Um, but I balance that with just yesterday um, I read an article Again, this isn't necessarily Bay Area specific, but early stage companies raising capital that over half of the transactions completed so far in 2024 are either flat rounds or down down rounds. So there are certain companies that are killing it. I mean, AI is all the rage right now, but how, how long is that going to be the case and some, some digital health? Um, so you've got some winners, but then a lot of companies are struggling right now as well. Lastly, just yesterday, I spoke with a transactional attorney with one of the leading firms down in the Bay. And just in the past 30 days, he started to see an uptick both in terms of M&A activity and in new Series A and Series B fundings. So I think the rest of 2024 is going to be really interesting to to see how the year wraps up. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the broader economy, national, maybe global is maybe the way to think of it. You mentioned interest rates. What is the economy, uh, you know, it, it keeps, when I turn on CNBC, and I'd love to hear where you guys get your news, um, you know, I know you talk to so many people uh, more than I do, and I talk to a lot, but the national economy, they're, they're not really, they're, they're, they've been painting it as, look out, a recession's coming. They've been saying that for like, I don't know, how long now? A long time, almost like we just keep waiting, but yet we feel like we're moving in the right direction. Do you feel like the information that we're getting in, from the mainstream media is accurate? Or how would you uh, characterize the, uh, the US economy and, and maybe the global economy? Well, you know, let's talk about the US economy. Um, I, we, we've become data junkies. So I think even the casual observer knows when CPI and PPI come out. <laughs> and 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 also unemploy, uh, unemployment numbers and job growth numbers. I mean, And then they're uh, revised and, and it's like, okay, yeah, we're yeah. babysitting the crap out of those things though. Yeah, and so we're all, we're very in tune to what's going on and the market reacts one way or the other with that. And uh, 800,000 plus job revision downward. I mean, it, you know, last, when was that last week, Brian? Yeah, and so it, it, it's, it's just, just a number, it didn't it, affect it, Anything. It, it is, uh, it you is, know, just a number. So, um, but what does their gut tell us? I mean, our gut tells us is that inflation has really been tough on people. Um, you know, in aggregate since 2020 versus now, prices are up more than 20%. So, you know, what does a gallon of milk cost and, or a carton of eggs and a loaf of bread? Significantly more than what it did back then. And that's painful. And have wages risen 20%? I don't think so. And I'm talking this, you know, for the vast number of Americans. But I think that uh, going forward, um, you're, the Fed is going to finally uh, start lowering rates. And hopefully the yield curve, you know, in the difference between the two-year treasury and the 10-year treasury will, won't be inverted as when we speak here a year from today yeah. and I think that'll be a real positive thing and so um, uh, I think that uh, our economy is going to be fine it may be a little slower than it was you know we have an election coming up which always impacts things you've got somebody that's uh, uh, maybe a little less uh, uh, you know from a regulatory perspective would be kind of in an easing mode mm-hmm. which is always good for business 
Yeah. I mean, I always think that the best way to win in business is to kind of sell your way out of it, right? You can sell your way out of anything if, if you're not, you know, overregulated, let's call it. Uh, you can, you have a lot more uh, but, room to grow. You know, but, you know, as good business people, you know, we just know, we just want to know what the rules are. Yeah. Tell us what the rules are and we'll deal with it, right? You know, we'll, we'll figure it out. So are the regulations uh, in favor of a smaller bank that, or uh, is there is there less, uh, um, I guess, government scrutiny on a smaller bank versus a big bank? Uh, I wouldn't say that's okay. the case. Um, I'd say there are some regulations that are sensitive to size, um, which is good. Um, but generally speaking, there's still the same yeah. amount of scrutiny. Okay. Uh, so... Um, it, which is fine. I think we need to have a safe and sound banking system, and as bankers, we need to how to we need to operate under that construct. We're the business of trust, okay? And you can argue that's why Silicon Valley Bank failed, and First Republic Bank failed because their customers stopped trusting them, and so that's what's so important in terms of for us how we conduct ourselves in a day in day out basis to do nothing but to uh, um, you know to strengthen that trusting relationship that we have with our customers and be consistent as you said on and on you know and communicate regularly all of those things are kind of essential to help you know guide our customers through this period okay so the grand opening is happening in September mm-hmm and this is in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and there's is there a big what happens when uh you know that you plant your flag and is there a celebration? What's the what happens? You hire can hire you, a bunch of employees. Can you make sure that he gets an invitation? <laughs> Mike invited me. I might Did have something going yeah, that day, yeah. okay. but I'm gonna you know I thank you though, James. I really appreciate it, and I'm I'm hoping to get there. So I don't. So we're expecting yeah. about 300 people. Oh wow! And this is going to be a big deal because. Um, what we've done here is unique. We've actually come into an area, you know, into San Francisco. It's just contrary, right? It's a contrarian move. And, um, and we just want to celebrate that. Mm-hmm. So we've invited a lot of folks that we know here. Mm-hmm. Say, well, if you're not doing anything, come on down to San Francisco. Well, we'll, uh, you know, have a glass of wine Let's work together. that neighborhood advantage. Let's well, get the, the, well, the bigger, let's broaden the neighborhood. speaking of that, it's going to be a, a great day, a lot of fun, but there's actually also going to be a lot of work going on. So, for example, I have two partners of a San Jose-based venture fund who are coming up, but they asked if they could use one of the conference rooms for a uh, uh, investment committee meeting from three to five in the wow. afternoon. So, if you can come down to San Francisco yeah, well, there could I'll be some great connectivity for you. I can break you. my uh, plans and see. Uh, so I'll, I'll try because I really appreciate what you're doing. I love the, con- you know, not every contrarian theory or a move is right, but when you make the right one, it can it can really make an impact. And I love how you're tying this back to the neighborhood, uh, John, uh, to use your term. Um, I do think it's going to be good for Sacramento. Well, so... And it's a two-way street, as James was mentioning earlier. And GFX, your annual conference, we're proud to be partners and sponsors of, provides a fantastic venue to provide those companies and investors in the Bay Area to see the opportunities and the growth and all of the great things that are happening in the the capital region. So uh, from our perspective, we use that as an event to try to engage as many folks from the Bay Area part of the region into Sacramento. And we really appreciate it. Last year, you brought in uh, a keynote speaker that was, you know, off the charts, uh, you know, in, in venture capital and, and other things. And, you know, you've, you've helped us so much with that. But when they get when they come in and they see what's happening in Sacramento, they begin to build they don't think of us quite as that government cow town as much as they did prior to coming in. They they think we have a lot of love for one another and appreciation of our, our hometown, but uh, there are, there's also an attractiveness to, to this. Well, we have a real world example that involves Five Star and the Growth Factory. I won't get into the name specifically, but just in the past two weeks, there's been a Bay Area fund that has invested in a Sacramento company 
that came through the collective ecosystem of nice. the Growth Factory, uh, Moneta Ventures, and Five Star Bank. So it's happening in reality yeah. right now, and we want to build upon that. And when you mentioned 15 years ago, I started the show in 2015. So that's I didn't I don't think I even knew what venture capital was before that. So I probably learned it, you know, year two of the show. Started investing into local funds and stuff, and like oh, angel investing, and started appreciating this. But what I remember feeling, and I still feel it, that there might be this sentiment there that, oh, there aren't really, there's no really no money in Sacramento. There, it's hard, if you're a startup, you can't get capital here. It, as you mentioned earlier, James, it's beginning to change, but it is gonna change in a big way with the effort that you guys are doing. Well, we, we hope that just we can be a, a contributor to a much bigger process that involves a lot of people along with us but but we love being the underdog and going into the big market taking on the prior incumbents and you know and and taking our community banking speed service professionalism desire to help and and bringing that to the full neighborhood now okay so i'll ask two more questions and then we can kind of wrap you know you guys are busy but uh one i want to use your um your underdog uh metaphor because entrepreneurs, we feel like the underdog typically. And you guys talk to so many entrepreneurs every day and all of us feel like the underdog. It's typically you're not talking to, you know, Fortune 500 companies when you're going out to do your banking. I know that you have big customers, but a lot of underdogs uh, are, are your, your customers are the underdogs in many cases. What advice would you give to us underdogs in order to uh, figure out a way to win? I would use the backyard advantage to its fullest and extend that to the neighborhood mm -hmm. advantage. Uh, just as uh, I think you have a slogan on the wall downstairs about it. it one person can't create a- <laughs> Nobody a great, builds a truly great company uh, alone. Run, right? Yes. So find what your particular expertise is and build your team with complementary skill sets around that. and and bank with the best bank you could possibly bank with and we'll help you any way we can and and uh, and land your first you know set of customers that provide validation for you the combination of those things i think will get that underdog startup on the right path yeah and i think it's i think it's attitudinal fundamentally and it's about having grit it's about being persistent because we're going to get told no we get told no every day but we don't give up. We're gonna continue to try to break that rock. And it happens. And then sometimes it happens when you don't even really try that hard. Things just come your way. And it's that, when that happens, that means you've done some great work. Um, could be years before that. Uh, and when it happens, it's a wonderful thing. But it's just being persistent and having that grit and being able to take it take one on the chin okay happens to us all the time right get up come on fight's not over there's get no, up there's no crying in baseball <laughs> uh, well that's a mic drop these are mic drop type quotes so i i mean i i, I told i promised the audience i had one more question so uh, uh okay so what did i not ask you guys i'll start with you john what did i not ask that we sh you want to make sure we cover um, for the uh, for the venture and small business entrepreneurial uh, well, audience. One, one item that I did not mention when we were talking about venture debt and the reasons for it, from an investor perspective, why it's important in many cases for not just the founder, but for the investors, is it provides a source of non-dilutive capital, mm -hmm. right? So oftentimes investors wanna minimize the dilution on their companies once they get to a certain stage. And in the right circumstances, not all circumstances, venture debt becomes the right complementary tool for investment capital. Okay. So I think that element is very helpful. Yeah. Yes, we nobody wants to give up, uh, you know, all their business or most of their business. So you, sometimes it happens. But yeah, to, to minimize the dilution is huge. Uh, James, okay, so what is, you, this is the mic drop moment. Now you just you gave sure. us one. Can you do back to back <laughs> mic drop moments here? Well, it, I think it's I think for your uh, your listeners, uh, Mark, it's really trying to understand that we're better together. We're better together. And it's not that, uh, you know, we can't stand alone by ourselves up here in the capital region, up here in Roseville, because there's so many wonderful things going on. 
Uh, but we're better together. We can grow our businesses faster. We can accelerate our growth. We'll learn more if we're connected. And we're, we have a mindset as such, an open mindset, if you will, to be able to take advantage of what this great region, this mega region has to offer. You know, we're sitting here before the broadcast talking about the 49ers. I mean, if that doesn't bring everybody together, I don't know what can. Come on, right. right. Yeah. You know, and the Beatles so, sung about that too, right? Come together right now. <laughs> yeah, right? I think we're so. Doing. So we're, that's what we're practicing, you know, and, and in a bigger picture, this is where we see our future to be this large regional bank that's headquartered in the capital region that it really helps drive economic development throughout all of Northern California. Love it. Appreciate you guys coming on the show. Obviously, a lot of words of wisdom and reminders of how to win. Sometimes we forget, but uh, you, you sometimes you got to take one on the chin. So I, I love that. Motivates me because I've been taking a few over the last few years, and here I am still battling. <laughs> hey, can I change my prediction? Yes. <laughs> Who are you going to pick now? It's going to be the Rams this year. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. we're going to have to have a side bet on these. Okay. There you go. I love it. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate right. you coming on the Thanks, show. Thanks, Mark. Thank really you. appreciate it. That was great. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.